Let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to Coast, This Week in America. K.J. Crook is an award-winning visual artist, is both the author and the illustrator of the multi-award-winning hit Leo Gray and the Lunar Eclipse. K.J. is also the creator of the Superstellar Dream Scholarship, a year-round scholarship that provides financial assistance and encouragement to students pursuing innovative and altruistic goals in the arts and STEM. Also the founder of TOL, T-O-L Academy, an online learning program that promotes creative thinking powered by individualized educational content with Leo Gray books. Leo Gray and the Lunar Eclipse, a multi-award winning middle grade novel that follows a young boy to school inside of the moon. But once there, he and his crew of international friends are soon swept off on a race against the clock to bring dual plans to destroy the Earth and their cherished Luna City to a stop before the next eclipse. Kirkus Review calls Leo Gray a page-turner comparable to A Wrinkle in Time, The City of Ember, and Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Fans and critics alike deem it a must-read. That's like Scooby-Doo meets the Jetsons and the Hardy Boys meets the Guardians of the Galaxy. Author, illustrator of Leo Gray and the Lunar Eclipse, K.J. Crook, our guest on This Week in America. K.J., welcome to the program. It's a delight to have you with us. Thank you so much, Rick, for having me. I'm excited to be here. I've heard so much about these books, and the reviews are excellent. Tell me a little bit about yourself, a background, and where this fascination with writing and illustrating and creating a futuristic world came from. Where did this all come from? Yeah, sure. So I guess um, my background's mainly in the arts. I was the nerdy little art kid drawing all day um, (laughs) in class, just scribbling away my little stories that were popping up in my head. Um, And I went to school for art and kind of thought that that was going to be the route that I was going to be on. Um, But I kind of lost track of my painting and drawing. And so when I moved to um, Hawaii um, from, from Minneapolis, I found myself even more unable to paint and draw. And I looked back and thought about all the other things I loved to do in school. And that was creative writing. So that was kind of how um, I got back on track with writing and then finally illustrating, uh, which took a little while to remember I could do. Yeah, it's interesting. At an early age, what was it? Did did you read a lot? Did your parents encourage you reading so you developed that side? I know my dad, he was like the platinum bathroom reader, right? Oh, yes, <laughs> right. yes. Yeah, so there was always lots of books around, but <laughs> I would get so distracted when I was reading because I would get to like page two or three and I was just off in my own little world. Um, so it, mainly, like the main books I read um, were just nonfiction books, kind of like history books, everything that was really boring, like architecture books, um, those sort of things. But when I was really young, you know, elementary school, the main books I was sort of into um, were the Nancy Drew books. Oh, yes. So that yes. was kind of where my reading fiction kind of stopped um, towards middle school. But um, yeah, Nancy Drew, I always loved Nancy Drew. When did you decide this is interesting reading what other people have written and the worlds that they've created, but I want to create my own because you've done that with, with Leo Gray. Where did that come from? You want to develop not only characters, but a world in which these characters flourish. You know, I think that stems from the arts high school I went to. Um, So when I was like 14, I went to this little boarding school for kids that were gifted with the arts. So there was like a music section and an art section for the art students and dancers who did the dance class and theater. And I remember when I was there, I just thought, oh, this is should this is how school should be. You know, everybody should be learning what it is they're passionate about and what they love to do. So um, Leo's story very much kind of follows my own. I was, you know, something of this like art kid prodigy growing up and had to go off on my own into the real world, right? Moving (laughs) away from home at a young age and then getting to tap into my art with specialized training. So that's what I wanted the main character to do. I didn't know at the time I was kind of rewriting my own story, but there's kind of a bit, quite a bit of me in there. 
with us on This Week in America, K.J. Kruk, that's K-R-U-K, author and illustrator of the uh, multi-award winning book, Leo Gray and the Lunar Eclipse. You'll find it, of course, the usual places. I'll give you a couple of uh, websites as we go through the program. We've got leograybooks.com, kjcruck.com to get information on, uh, on Leo, information on K.J., and you can order the book there as well. When did you decide to write a children's novel? Was this something, this Leo character that's almost sort of like KJ, was this something you've been thinking about for a long time? No, it just fell into my head. It was the craziest thing. So kind of backtracking on the story again, my husband and I, we had just relocated from Minneapolis to Hawaii. And I was poking around at writing, trying to get my creativity back because I couldn't paint, I couldn't draw. Um, despite being in the most beautiful place exactly. in all the yes. world, right? <laughs> um, and so I was just, you know, trying to write, and I was writing this little story that was really uncreative. It was about a little girl who goes into a magical woods and everything's enchanted. And, um, you know, the story's been told a million times, but that was kind of where my little writing was going. And so I asked um, my husband what he was thinking of the story I was writing, and you know, he replied in Polish, Pan Fardowski, the man on the moon is what he would rather write about, um, essentially blowing off my little story. So um, I kind of stormed out onto the balcony. And as I was looking at um, Diamond Head Crater, that iconic volcano you see on oh, every yes. Waikiki postcard, yes. um, I heard the main character's mother's voice just start belly aching about how her futuristic um, husband wouldn't buy them. Um, any of the high-tech gadgets of the future, like a robotic washing machine. Um, so that was kind of where the story all began. In creating this world, well, give us the time frame. This is like, what, 20, 2113, where the story takes place. Yes, yeah, so it's quite a bit quite a bit in the future. <laughs> well, that's interesting <laughs> because in that's a totally blank slate. You can create anything you want for 2113. How much fun was that to create the the technology that uh, may or may not be there. Yeah, you know, what was funny is that, you know, I don't really, like, watch the news or, like, dig through media on the Internet. I kind of just keep to my own little world because that's the only way I know how. Um, but every time I would come up with something, you know, I would be talking to somebody about it, they'd be like, oh, yeah, that's already invented. That's created. You know, like, <laughs> the, the Roomba, the Roomba thing. Oh, yes, um, yes. Of course, I've you know, thought of, like, the Apple sort of watch, and that was something that came out just a little bit afterwards. It was, like, pretty similar to what we, I think, a lot of us were expecting for futuristic gadgets is what I put in. Because um, I also didn't want it to be too... Um, you know, for kids, sometimes when they read something and it's really like overwhelmingly different, um, it, you can make, it can make them kind of go in the opposite direction reading, which I know that was the way for me as, as a kid. I mean, I could never read sci-fi growing up because it was just too, you know, about the gadgets, oh, yes, <laughs> it was too much yes. about the gadgets, but I did try to make them a bit more whimsical and fun. And I just tried to go with whatever came to my mind, not trying to make it too, you know, too techy or delve too much into all the jargon that comes with that. Leo Gray and the Lunar Eclipse is the book. It's a multi-award winning middle grade novel. Talk about specifically uh, aiming for middle grade and what goes into doing that. So you don't overwhelm them with too much, but you give them enough that it's entertaining and get their minds to think. The thought process in designing it for that age group. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a kid at heart. I don't think I've, I, I don't think I'll ever be an adult. <laughs> so There's nothing maybe wrong with that's that. the reason why I don't watch the news. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, middle grade was kind of when, you know, I went in the opposite direction from reading fiction because books quickly got really dark. Um, you know, they had touched on a lot of harder topics than I was ready to hear. Um, and of course those things are still you know, there's still some aspects of those things in, in my book as well, because they're kind of necessary with life. Um, but sorry, the horn outside just distracted nothing, me. Nothing wrong with that. Well, because that, that, you created this world that really fits with the, in all of the awards, it would take me like half the program to read all the awards that the book Leo Gray and the Lunar Eclipse has won and continues to, uh, to do. The reviews have just been excellent on this. Well, what do you hope is the takeaway as as 
young people and older people as well read and are entertained with the story, there's more to it than just an entertaining story, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. You know, as I've read it over, you know, the book's really about, you know, being true to who you are, finding out who you are, you know, standing up for what you believe is right. It's about being bold and brave and confident. And I think all those things that middle schoolers kind of are in the shadows about, right? So you almost say middle school sort of lost in the shuffle, don't you? It, it's not, you know, the, the early grades when the kids are going to, you know, preschool and going the first couple of years. It's not junior high school when they're making that transition. It's yeah, the middle yes. grades. What was that like for you, middle grade? Can you remember middle back? Grade, yes, for me, I mean, I was a total loner. <laughs> <laughs> total loner, just, you know, again, just sitting during class, drawing and uh, drawing away. But what was nice... Um, Again, when I transitioned school, then I had the complete opposite spectrum. I went from total honor to kind of being more in in the spotlight, um, which was something also the school, I think, did with all the students was gave them a place to shine with their talent, you know. Um, But, yeah, I think that... uh, that was me. <laughs> yeah, and, and we talked about sort of creating this world. You've got these great characters. Uh, we talked about Leo briefly. Talk a little bit about Leo and then the other characters. He's got quite a group he's running around with there that's trying to figure out all these problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's Leo, and he, I think, is the most like me. He's a little nerdy, a little shy. Um, he has to find his courage and his bravery, which that's the stuff I've got to work on. Um, And then he has his um, buddies at the school that he meets, and they're all from all around the world. So um, Andromeda, not Andromeda, (laughs) but Andromeda, she's from Canada, and she is really gifted with math and hacking things. And she also has a special knack at being really good at the moon sport there, which is called Gravidol, which is those little anti-gravity kind of tennis game that I made up um, with robots. Obviously, there must be robots. <laughs> it has to be robots. Yes. And then he has um, another buddy, Pavo, which is kind of like the classic every guy's best buddy um, who's from Brazil. And um, another friend, Phoebe, from France, who's a drama student. And then we've kind of got our little um, comedian, uh, Gruss, from Australia. And he's into little everything that's cute and cuddly and loving in life, which I guess is another side of me as well. Um, but I tried to make sure that all the characters who are from another country have a little bit of their foreign language put in there, too. So that was I'm not native in, in those languages. So it was really fun looking it up and trying to make sure that I wasn't sabotaging the language <laughs> as I was putting in little catchphrases. Well, fun for the readers, too, to go through and again, learning something, entertained by the story and learning something as they go. K.J. Crook is our guest on This Week in America, the book we're talking about. Leo Gray and the Lunar Eclipse. When you started off on this, did you know where the story was going to go? I guess what I'm asking is, do you have a, some people say you need an outline. You have it all laid out, then you go back and fill in. And others say, no, I just sort of let the story go where it's taking me. Yeah, I definitely was the later because I didn't, you know, think I was writing a book for a really long time. I was more like, I thought I was doing something like journal writing. You know, I didn't oh, think yes. anybody was going to read it. <laughs> um, so it, it wasn't until I got almost a little after, a, a little over midway, where I was like, you know, this is adding up to quite a bit of typing, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I started to connect the dots that, you know, what, I am writing a book, and hey, it is for children. Um, but... Yeah, in developing the characters, it's always, I think, tricky. You want enough characters that it makes the story interesting, but you can't overwhelm us with too many characters. Uh, how did you come up with that with, with the characters, Leo and his cast that you just talked about, which is seems like the, a great number, and they sort of complement Leo. I think, you know, it probably came from, like, all the Scooby-Doo I watched as a kid, just like the mystery gang sort of yes. set up. Um, I'm thinking, you know, because, I mean, I, I did have friends. I, did, I wasn't a complete loner. I did have friends growing up. <laughs> but it's in backtracking on that a bit. And I was always like, you know, there's one girl and then two other girls. But then, um, so it was always like a trio for the most part. But then when I swapped schools, I had more of like more friends all around me, right? So yes. um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I put any thought into it. It just kind of formed itself. 
Well, that works for you, and you've created this little empire that you're building there with the with the books and the academy that I'm I ask you about here in a second, and you've got uh, toys that you're introducing as well with with the Leo Gray character. Talk about this academy, academy, because yes. you're just not stopping at entertaining kids and giving them a little uh, subtle education as they're growing up. Yeah, you're I, really I know out. it's terrible. I'm terrible because I grew up, um, you know, beyond wanting to be a classical painter, portrait artist. I also wanted to teach kids Italian because um, I nerdy and taught myself Italian and then went to school for it. And um, so I wanted to teach as well. Um, and so as soon as I kind of figured out I had written a children's novel, I instantly knew how important it is to teach what the messages are behind it and not just the messages, but there's, you know, with so many books, you can read it and you can go someplace beyond it in your own daily life. Um, and so that's what the Academy aims to do is to help kids, one, not just find a love for reading, but to be able to take what they've read and apply it to their everyday and Hopefully, you know, that can help help them to grow in ways they never expected from a book. I mentioned in the beginning with that, promoting creative thinking. How important is that? Obviously, you have or given the freedom to think creatively or you you assumed it at some point because your mind is uh, uh, is very valuable to you. It's very open. It's very creative. And you're able to come up with illustrations, coming up with with stories. How important is that? And is it I don't want to say suppressed, but we've got so much uh, pressure to, to sort of conform, you know, fed in in different categories. How important is that creative thinking? It's, it's the number one most important thing I feel the kids need right now because everybody can study. Everybody can learn to, you know, do all their math numbers correctly. These are all things you can be taught and trained. You can master piano. But if you can't, for example, create piano music, you know, from the heart, yes. from from your mind, there's no point in playing, right? Um, I mean, sure there is, but you get what I mean? Right. And because exactly. there's so many other kids that can then play piano and repeat every, every note and hit every note perfectly. You're just, an, again, another number in a sea of, of millions. Um, and right now it's so important for kids to be able to not just, you know, think and repeat, right? Which is a lot what school does. It's like, oh, you take a test and exactly. you're just supposed to regurgitate everything. It's always this regurgitation of knowledge instead of your unique knowledge, you know, looking at how you view the world. Um, and that, and that's what I hope also to uh, project with the book in the Academy and also with the super stellar dream scholarship we have to help encourage kids to not just, you know, do um, like, what is it called? Um, you know, the not customer service, it's called something else. I'm forgetting it right now. Um, but the environmental service. Oh, yeah, right? Okay, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, you get what I'm talking about. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> so yep. But to go beyond that and think, how can we, you know, expand upon something that helps others? Um, and it all stems with, you know, just thinking a step beyond, right? Yeah, anybody can learn a, multipl a multiplication table, but there's more to education than than just that. And it's so amazing what you're doing in, in reaching out and, and giving these opportunities to to the young people. K.J. Crook is our guest on the program. The book is Leo Gray and the Lunar Escape. Talk more a little uh, about the, uh, the scholarship when we come back after these messages on This Week in America. We're back. Our guest on the program today is K.J. Crutch. She is the author of Leo Gray and the Lunar Escape, actually the illustrator as well. We were talking before we left about the, the scholarship, and I really sense you're passionate about this. This is really something you want to do. Talk about that because you're really opening a lot of doors for a lot of young people out there. Yes. So that's, you know, again, as soon as I realized I had written a children's book, you know, and I looked back on my own life and how, you know, I was this young, little, talented person and how I also, you know, had family help support me and push me along the way. I realized that it was also my job to help do that for, you know, my fans and the kids that are reading my work and even the ones who, you know, are just hearing about the scholarship opportunity from someone else that we can help support you know, our future, because that's what kids really are. They're, they're it, you know, yes. they're, they're the future for us all. So we have to be there to help guide and lead the way, but also to support what creative endeavors 
they're up to, and especially if they're aiming to help others themselves. You write, you illustrate, and you create toys. You've got some great fan gear. And by the way, the video version of this you'll find on YouTube. If you go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, and click on videos, you'll see the video we're doing with uh, with KJ. Tell us about the uh, designing and developing the, the toy line that you've got. Yeah, so this it has been so much fun. I can't even tell you. It's a dream come <laughs> true. I'm so happy I'm doing this instead of what I originally set off to do <laughs> because selling houses is not as fun as designing your own little toy. Ooh, I like that, yes. This is the prototype, actually, of Grimloo, the little Lunaling. Um, So these are little moon creatures, except for he's the last one left on the moon, apparently. You'll have to read the book to find out more about that. Um, But yeah, so he can replace your little elf on a shelf. He can bend his little legs and... His little arms. Now, and how long does it take that, to develop something like that? I mean, you, you have this concept and you start, uh, uh, you know, drawing and, and putting it together. To get a finished product like that, how does that, how long does that take? What's the process it like? It takes a couple rounds of going back and forth with, um, you know, the toy team. So I started, I, I drew all the initial design, like prototype designs for it. And then I sent it back and then they show me their version. I'm like, nope, you got to correct this, correct that, do this, do that. And it kind of goes, bounces back and forth for a little bit. Um, so for this one in particular, like three months, I think, about three months. That's so much fun. And you can see all of this at uh, KJ's website, which is kjcruck.com, K-R-U-K. Uh, Leo Gray Books, another website as well. So I think you just sort of, we ran over that there. What your regular job, or you could be showing me a three-bedroom bungalow now. You were in real estate Oh, yeah, yeah, I was in real estate um, for a while, which was great, but, you know, not as rewarding (laughs) as being able to, you know, share what you're passionate about with others. And, again, I had to kind of take a big leap of faith in myself um, to even jump away from that career because I was making really decent money, you know, and – Kind of everybody looked at me with a crazy eye, like, what are you doing? Going to write a children's book and trying to publish it. Well, the, um, instead there's of more staying than, put and keep selling houses. There's right? more than money, isn't there? And that's another lesson for those people at the, at the Academy and just fans, readers of the book. Follow your dream. Obviously, that's what you did. And I, I just love the enthusiasm you have for what, for what you're developing now. Yes. And I, I wish I was earlier to the game. You know, I took um, like took 10 years for me to try to figure it out. Um, but, you know, if you can start implanting those sort of concepts and images to kids from the get go, I mean, they're going to be so much more ahead of us. And that's especially what we need right now with the world. We need people who are thinking ahead. So Exactly, we do. And I got about a minute or so left. What are you working on? The book we're talking about is Leo Gray and the Lunar Eclipse. What are you working on now? I'm the sequel. All right. <laughs> the sequel. You're not going to get a name yet from me. So okay, okay. I thought we were going to spoiler alert here, but I, we don't have to say that because you're not going to give me any more than that. But you've got how long are you? How far are you into the project? I am. It is still like midway. I still have to keep trucking a bit on it because you know what. I, again, I don't like plot things. I kind of wait as things come. Yes. yes. Um, And I don't just sit there writing all day madly um, (laughs) in a little room (laughs) with candles wearing a robe, right? (laughs) That's not the kind of writer I am. But no, it's it's a lot. It's really a lot um, different from book one, which is so exciting. And I think readers are going to be kind of taken away with direction that it's turning. Um, so I think, yeah, I'm really looking forward to releasing it. Exciting. I'm going to take 30 seconds here. What's it like when you start getting feedback after you write Leo Gray and the Lunar Eclipse? You've got the website, you've got the book, you've got reviews, you've got, I mean, everybody falling in love with this. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, they're, they're comparing this to. What's it like when you start getting that feedback and suddenly it's- realize I don't have to sell another house if I don't want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's nice to know that you know, kids are taking from it what I was hoping they would take from it. Of course, it's not the book for everybody, but um, it's, you know, I feel that I made the right choice and that the hurdle I kind of had to go through waiting to publish it, um, giving up one career for the next, that everything is working out and that it was all worth it. And 
that I made the right choice. So you did make the right choice and you're able to touch so many people in their careers, be inspired by what you've done with the writing, with the, uh, the illustrating that you're doing and just making that career uh, pivot when all of a sudden it's like, you know, I would really rather be doing this and you, and you do it so well. KJ Kruk, our guest on the program, K-R-U-K, the book we're talking about specifically, Leo Gray and the Lunar Eclipse. You'll get information on our website on that, the scholarship, the academy, uh, as well as the, the the fan gear that she's got coming out, kjcruck.com, leograybooks.com, book available at Amazon, all the usual places. And you can find out more by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. KJ, a pleasure having you on the program. Hopefully we can do this again. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, thanks so much. You're welcome. KJ Cruck, author of Leo Gray and the Lunar Eclipse, as well as illustrator, more on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bache, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again at thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.